And the format is we're going to talk uh, for about an hour, and then we're going to open it to questions. So start saving your questions. Brian and Tom. Okay, Brian, a poet and somebody who is very interested in philosophy, Tom in cognitive science, and you in computer science. How did you two get together to do this book? Uh, Tom and I have known each other for now 11 years, and uh, we first met um, back at Brown University, where I was um, an undergrad uh, in both the computer science and philosophy departments, and was interested in finding ways that those two fields could talk to each other, um, and ways that uh, understanding the computer science behind problem solving was giving us insights into how, how the human mind works, how human intelligence works, and um, surprisingly, I was not finding as much uh, dialogue between those two departments as I expected there to be. Um, and then Tom showed up, um, and uh, Tom, well, you can talk a little bit about your own interests, but basically, um, Tom kind of pointed to cognitive science and, and computational cognitive science as an area in which, uh, you know, these, these concepts really do, do come into contact. And so I ended up uh, career-wise becoming a writer and, and writing, my, my first book is about uh, the Turing test and just more broadly, what have we learned about human intelligence from the 50-year quest to build machines in our own image? Um, and this book pursues a related series of questions, almost, almost in a dialectic with that book, which, in the sense that this book is asking, you know, what, what do we learn from the parallels between uh, the types of problems that computer scientists have to deal with and the types of problems that we face in everyday life? Yeah, so I'm a cognitive scientist, um, and what I work on is mathematical models of human cognition. So trying to understand how the human mind works and express that in mathematical terms. So you can kind of think about that as, it's like doing artificial intelligence or machine learning research, but instead of having our goal of making computers smarter, what we want to use is the same kind of mathematical tools to get better insight into how human minds work. And so the particular approach that I take is one of saying, let's think about the problems that people face in the course of our everyday lives, uh, think about what ideal solutions to those problems look like, and then you know, use that as a lens for studying what's going on in, in, in terms of human cognition and comparing to that. So I think for me, the starting point of this book was very much that kind of engagement with, you know, what are good ways of solving the problems that we face uh, and having a set of tools for doing that and a kind of vocabulary for thinking about those problems uh, that then, you know, is something that, that we are giving to you, <laughs> offering to other people as a way of engaging with the problems that they face in their own lives. Um, and I think this was really kind of a, a shared obsession of Tom and myself. And uh, over, you know, over the course of a number of conversations, we basically came to realize that we were starting to write what amounted to the same book. Um, and so it seemed natural that, uh, that we should just join forces and, and do it together. Now, you chose algorithms. And to some of us, well, this why don't you just tell us a little bit about the history of algorithms and why algorithms? So I think to most people, algorithms sound like something that's kind of intimidating and something that you think of computers as doing. Uh, but really, an algorithm is just a simple set of steps that you use to solve a problem. Uh, so you know, we learn algorithms in school when we learn how to do multiplication and division and so on. Uh, and in fact, those kinds of algorithms have been around for hundreds of years. Um, uh, and you know we're still following an algorithm when we do something like follow a recipe that bake mm -hmm. a cake. Um, so one of the ideas that's in the book is that uh, when we look at the algorithms that are used by computers, we do so in a way where we really focus on analyzing them in quantitative terms and figuring out what's the best way of solving this problem. And that's not something that we do for the you know the algorithms that we end up using in our own lives. So there's some kind of algorithm that we use for organizing our closet or. <laughs> for uh, trying to find an apartment or, mm -hmm. you know, but these are the algorithms that we don't learn in school. And um, what we do in the book is really take on those problems, look at good algorithms for solving those problems and subject them to the same kind of quantitative analysis that we're used to doing for computer algorithms. 
Okay, then as, you, um, as we talked about this and talked about algorithms, you very much like the chapter Explore and Exploit. And um, why do you like that chapter so much? I think that chapter in particular speaks to just one of the absolutely fundamental types of decisions that we all have to make in everyday life. So um, there's a certain category of decision uh, that comes up in, in a number of different ways, but it basically boils down to, do we do our favorite thing or do we try something new, right? So this comes up every time we have to figure out where to go out to eat, right? Do you go to your favorite place or do you go to the new place that just opened up? Um, it comes up whenever we play music. Uh, it comes up in our social lives, you know, do you, do you try to prioritize spending time with your close circle of friends or do you make time for someone who you just met where you think there's a shared connection you want to sort of get to know them? Um, this, uh, we intuitively understand that, you know, a life well lived includes some kind of balance between, you know, spending most of our time doing the things we know and love, but staying open to new possibilities and, and serendipity and so forth. And computer science tells you, in some sense, what that balance should be. Uh, there's this, one of the fundamental problems in computer science is called the explore-exploit dilemma, or the explore-exploit trade-off. Um, and the canonical form of this problem is uh, you walk into a casino, it's called the multi-armed bandit problem, which is uh, kind of an odd name, but if you think about it, the, the one-armed bandit uh, being a slot machine. You know, you walk into this casino, and there are all these different slot machines. They seem to pay off at different rates. And, you know, simply put, you want to make as much money as you can in some period of time. Well, intuitively, we understand that's going to involve a little bit of fact-finding, a little bit of just kind of pulling some handles and seeing, seeing what happens. Um, and then a certain period of just kind of cranking away on the machine that has seemed the most promising. Um, and so in computer science, this is this idea of exploration and exploitation. Um, and we, in the book, we sort of trace the, the history of the algorithms that have been designed to solve this problem. Um, it, during World War II, it was basically considered unsolvable. Um, the Allied uh, mathematicians in Britain joked about dropping the multi-armed bandit problem over Germany uh, as, as the ultimate instrument of intellectual sabotage to just waste their brain power. Um, and to the field's surprise, uh, answers actually started to come in the, in the late 50s through the 1970s. Um, and on to today. So we, we both look at the history of the problem as a problem, um, but chart the parallels to these questions that we have in everyday life about when do we try new things and when do we just do what we know and love. Yeah, I think, I think one interesting point about it is that uh, even though it might sound like an unfamiliar piece of math, uh, you've all been part of somebody else's explore exploit problem. So the same algorithms that we talk about in our chapter are the algorithms that are used for doing things like figuring out what the best web page to show you is in order to maximize the chance that you go through a transaction. So, you know, companies face this problem of trying to optimize the design of their web pages or uh, trying to uh, you know, figure out what the right uh, checkout flow is, or these, these other kinds of considerations, which are about trying to work out, you know, what the best way is to provide you with information. Um, uh, or another canonical example is choosing the best ads to maximize the chance that you'll end up like, clicking on them. And so they face exactly this explore exploit problem. So they have this problem of how do I, you know, do I choose the ad that I know is very likely to get clicked on, or do I choose this new ad which I just got that I could potentially put up there and might might be better? And so uh, the algorithms that they're used to solving those problems are exactly the algorithms that we recommend to you for uh, doing things like figuring out what restaurant to go to, where you're pulling different arms on that multi app bandit when you're trying to figure out do I go to a restaurant that I know or do I go to a new place? Um, but there are also algorithms which are starting to be used in other parts of, uh, of sort of decision making which is done by statisticians and computer scientists. So uh, one of the, su the, the surprising places where we're just starting to see some of these algorithms being used is in the context of clinical trials. So um, if you think about the problem that doctors face when they're trying to test new medicines, they have exactly this problem of, do I give this patient the best known treatment or do I give this patient 
a treatment which we've never tried before, but mm -hmm. might be better. Um, and the way that society currently solves that problem is using clinical trials where you divide people up into two groups and one person gets the best treatment and one person you know gets the new treatment and so you know you 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 sort of uh, split the 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 treatments among those groups but in fact that's not the best way of sort of satisfying this tension between discovering new information and providing the best treatment and some of these algorithms actually provide a better way of solving that problem and so they're starting to be used in medicine for those reasons too you know, when I read the book, I, I was fascinated by just some very simple problems. Um, parking. We've all seen one space here, one space there. And then you also um, interviews. How many people one has to interview uh, before you've interviewed enough? And um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, because that those really apply it to some very practical issues that all of us are facing. Um, for those of you who tried to park tonight. and. Um, how does that relate in that way? These are very practical problems, and you're using algorithms to develop systems. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> parking is uh, an example of a, a genre of problem that's called an optimal stopping problem, <laughs> um, which in a, in a driving context is totally literal, right? Um, but more broadly, the, the structure of an optimal stopping problem occurs in any situation where you're basically presented with a, a series of opportunities, one after another, and at each moment you can either commit to the thing in front of you, in which case you kind of forego all of these future possibilities, or you, uh, you walk away, in which case you may not have the opportunity to come back. And so, you know, this is certainly the case of parking, where as you're approaching, you know, as you're approaching uh, the venue tonight, you ask yourself, you know, is this a good enough space to just go for it? I'm X number of blocks out. Should I try for a better thing? But, you know, maybe I'll end up with nothing. Um, so, you know, what's interesting about this problem is um, there are these extremely clear solutions that take the form of a kind of, uh, we call it a look then leap rule, where we, we give you, you know, exactly what percentage of things to evaluate to form some kind of baseline and then immediately commit after that baseline. Um, parking is certainly a, a problem of this form. Um, I think looking for an apartment in San Francisco is also this form where you walk in and you basically have to just hand the check to the landlord at the open house or walk away and know that there's no chance that you can call them back and get the place. Um, so that same anxiety of like, have I seen enough places to make a good choice? Um, and many people have argued that uh, dating is also of this form, where you're in a relationship, do you either commit to that person or do you walk away and possibly lose the, the opportunity to come back? Yeah, for the we, parking- Don't just uh, raise questions, now <laughs> answer some. Sure. <laughs> I was gonna say, if, yeah, for the parking problem, I can do that. So we actually have a table on page 25 where we tell you, uh, if you can estimate the proportion of spots that are free, Okay. Then uh, you can use that information to uh, to determine how many cars out you should you should stop. So you know you can you can work out how many spaces away from the destination you should be willing to take the next spot and commit. So that's a you can memorize this table. Uh, I, I can you know if it's if it's uh, three percent free, then you want to be 23, 23 spaces away. You switch from looking to leaping. If it's you know two percent free, it's thirty five. If it's one percent free, it's sixty nine. If it's zero point one percent, it's six hundred and ninety three. And then we had one extra line in this table, which our editor cut, which says you know if it's uh, any anything which is uh, below that, then you should just not drive a car, uh, <laughs> which I think characterizes certain parts of San Francisco. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I, I noticed when you were talking about the apartments in the book, you say, on the first go around, don't even bring your checkbook. Right. Why? Right. So the, the canonical optimal stopping problem is what's called the secretary problem. And it's you know, of the same form. You know, you're hiring a secretary. A bunch of candidates show up in a random order. At each step, uh, you interview a candidate and either hire them on the spot and send everyone else home, or you dismiss them, in which case you won't get the chance to hire them again. Um, the answer that you get in terms of what is the appropriate uh, balance to strike between looking and leaping is 37%. So it turns out that you should evaluate the first 37% of the pool totally non-committally with no intention of hiring anyone, no matter how good they are. Um, 
<laughs> which is it's a shame for those people. Um, and you have a sort you you use this period to establish a base a baseline. You have kind of who was the best person that I saw in this benchmarking period, um, and then after that thirty seven percent threshold, uh, be prepared to immediately offer the job to the next person you see who's better than the best person in that first thirty seven percent. Um, and this algorithm will not guarantee that you succeed all the time. In fact, it only has a success rate of 37%. Um, so you will still fail 63% of the time. Um, it just so happens that uh, it's a hard problem, and uh, that's the best you can do. Now, what about on dating? Uh, well, dating, you know, it's essentially the same problem of uh, trying to find a secretary or an apartment, right? Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we do do is, is, is deal with the fact that perhaps it's not exactly the same problem. Um, uh, and fortunately, you know, there's been about 50 years of, you know, intense intellectual effort by mathematicians considering every possible variant on the secretary problem. Uh, and as a consequence, we know a lot about it and we know a lot about the ways in which when you change the assumptions, it changes the rule that you should follow. So one thing that you might imagine about dating is that it's perhaps riskier than apartment hunting. Like, uh, you know, if you followed the 37% rule, you would evaluate your first 37% of candidates and then you would uh, be prepared to, to make an offer uh, <laughs> following that. Um, we, we actually sort of uh, point out the correspondence that this has to, you know, human lifespans. And if you assume you've got, you know, Basically, maybe the period between 18 and 40 is a period where you're looking for a, uh, you know, a, a, a partner. Then somewhere around 27 is the point where things stop being fun and start getting serious. Um, <laughs> but those assumptions uh, are based on the idea that if you make an offer to somebody, then they're going to say yes. Um, and if that's not the case, you should actually change your algorithm. So, um, for example, if there's a 50% chance that someone's going to turn you down if you make an offer to them, uh, then you should spend less time looking and more time leaping. Uh, so you should only look at the first 25% of the pool and then make offers to anybody who's better than that first 25%. Um, or uh, if, in fact, dating is more permissive than uh, apartment hunting, uh, and if you go back, you have a chance, you know, you sort of break up with someone, but then years down the line, you realize that, in fact, they were the one for you. And we talk about some mathematicians who had those kinds of realizations. Um, uh, so uh, the most famous of whom is, is Kepler, the, uh, the astronomer, who, who went through a series of, you know, 11 partners over a, a series of years uh, and ended up deciding that number five was the best. Um, and went back and then I made an offer to her and accepted and had lots of children and everything worked out fine. Yeah. So, so if you're in that kind of situation where, uh, say, there's a 50% chance that somebody will, will sort of accept an offer from you even after you've broken up with them, um, then you can be more conservative. Uh, and then it's fine to go, you know, you can look at the first 61% of the pool. Uh, before you start making offers. And then if you get to the very end and you've not found someone, then you go back and find the best one who, who you passed over. Now, when you're doing this, and I'm, I know the book is just out, and so, so nobody can get angry at you yet <laughs> for following one of your algorithms and passing up something that they wish they hadn't done. Um, how, what, in terms of human beings, when you think of the look and leap, where is the great tendencies? Oh, you mean in what do people actually do? Yeah, in, in terms of it, yes. And what is it in, because so much of what you're doing is leading people to greater rationality. But, but let, let's just talk about the human yeah. condition, if you will. And without following an algorithm, what would be the, the, um, the average percentages regarding looking and leaping? Uh, it turns out if you do these studies in a lab, people start leaping at 31%. Um, which is not bad, but it's a little rash. Um, and we talk about this, and I think one of, the, one of the big themes of the book is that, you know, when there's, when there's a, a tension between what people do and what the model says they should do, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're the ones doing it wrong. It may be that the model is failing to capture something about the problem. So in this case, um, what they found was that beginning to leap around 31%, is the optimal thing to do if you incur a 1% penalty for each candidate that you consider. Okay. Um, and at first, you know, the experimenters were a little bit vexed by this because they said, well, we didn't 
there is no penalty. We didn't, we didn't include a penalty. Um, and at some point they realized that there's just intrinsically a penalty to spending more time doing things. <laughs> like their subjects just got bored. They didn't want to stay doing this experiment. And they were saying, you know, we've tried to find rigorous formal models for our subjects getting bored. Um, and we're still, we're, that's an open problem. Um, so, but I, but I think this is really one of the bigger themes of the book is that um, it, the, the tension between what people do naturally and, and what the model tells us prompts in many cases, and the same is true in the explore exploit problem, it prompts kind of a reevaluation of the assumptions of the problem. And in many cases, we find that people's intuitions are pretty good for the problems that they're actually solving when you take those, those uh, things into, into consideration. And would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, uh, I would, you know, go on to say that um, I think this kind of point about, you know, th there being a, a, a reevaluation of rationality is actually a, a, a really important point that we want to make. So mm -hmm. um, I think it, it's very easy to think about decision making, you know, rational decision making as being a matter of evaluating all of your options and thinking hard about each one and then, you know, putting a lot of time into it and, you know, crunching the numbers and then coming out with exactly the right answer every time. Uh, and one of the, the real themes of the book is that, um, you know, that's kind of what computers do if you give them easy problems to solve. Mm -hmm. But when you start to give computers hard problems to solve, then none of those things are true. So, you know, in optimal stopping, one of the things you do is you don't look at all of your options. Uh, and um, uh, for explore exploit, sometimes it makes more sense to take a chance and try something new rather than, you know, focus on getting the very best thing at that exact moment. And, you know, as we start to look at other kinds of algorithms, you see taking a chance, using approximations, these are all characteristics of what it takes to solve hard problems efficiently. And starting to think about that trade off between how hard you have to think and, you know, how good a solution you get gives us a much more nuanced way of viewing what rational decision making looks like. Uh, and I think one that is much more forgiving to us as human beings who, mm -hmm. you know, who are trying to do the best we can to solve the difficult problems that we're, pay we're faced with. You know, staying with the notion of being human beings, and of course rationality is part of being a human being, but often we sometimes think of rationality as not being part of being human as it's somewhat becoming more of a machine. And so as you work between these two areas of the mind and the computer, um, how do you distinguish them? And do you look at the mind as a sophisticated computer? Do you look at the computer as a replica of the mind? What is the relationship that you see between mind and computer? Uh, that's, a, that's a difficult question in that it's, you know, it's one of the fundamental questions that we ask in cognitive science is, you know, to what extent can we make good computational models of human cognition, right? I mean, I think there are two dimensions to what you're asking, where one is the technical question about, you know, is it going to be possible to capture you know, our cognitive processes in computers? Uh, and the other is a sort of existential question, right? Which is about, like, you know, um, if we think about being rational, does that make us somehow be less human, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and so maybe I'll focus on the first one and Brian can talk about the second one since he wrote a whole book about it. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think, you know, as a cognitive scientist, the, the premise of the work that I do is that we are going to be able to capture, you know, the, the sort of the, the structure of human cognition in those terms, that, um, that it makes sense for us to ask questions about, you know, what are the algorithms that characterize the nature of human thought? And, uh, and I think what we're doing in this book is somewhere between descriptive and prescriptive, right? Where, you know, one part of it is, let's look at these, these problems that humans have to solve and work out what good solutions to those problems look like. But the other part is, uh, let's use the structure of those problems as a guide to try and understand what actually is going on inside human minds. And so in mm -hmm. the book we talk about, you know, not only what do people do in optimal stopping and explore exploit problems, but also things like, how is it that seeing how computers organize their memory gives us clues about how people might organize their memory? Okay. Uh, and how is it that you know mm -hmm. the mathematics of game theory might inform the way that we think about the origins of human emotions and you know the the structure of human interaction? Or how does computer networking tell us about you know what makes a good conversation and what makes a good conversation partner in particular? And so uh, I think 
a lot of that is couched on the premise that we're, we're going to be able to express those aspects of, of human cognition in computational terms. Um, yeah, as I mean, as to this question of whether you know striving striving to be more rational um, makes us less human. I mean, I for me it's interesting thinking about this in the context of like the history of Western philosophy because you've got I mean this is one of the oldest questions you know going back to Aristotle and so forth is like what is it that makes human human beings distinct and unique and special. And the traditional way of answering this question was to compare ourselves to animals, um, because that was the closest thing. Mm -hmm. And so you've got you know people like Aristotle saying, um, well, animals, uh, you know, they form social attachments. They can navigate, you know, the, the world. Uh, they have desires. They can, you know, do this sort of rudimentary problem solving. So the the essence of being human can't be there. It must be only in this set of things which humans alone can do and animals cannot. Things like, you know, syllogistic logic and, you know, algebra and um, these sorts of things which today would seem like very strange places to try to locate like the seat of human uniqueness precisely because of uh, the advent of, of computing. And so in some ways I think for me it's extremely uh, it's kind of a philosophically exciting time to be alive because we've basically turned this 2,500 year old question on its head and we're now asking it in a completely different way, which is rather than being obsessed with how we're different from animals, we're obsessed with how we're different from machines. Um, and in some ways, you know, in some ways this book like maybe drives back in the other, other direction and saying like, uh, I think it's fair to view computers in some sense as our comrades in terms of they are up against the same limits of time and space and memory. Um, and, you know, as Tom was saying, uh, the ability to consider all of your options exhaustively and always compute your way to, a, you know, a perfect answer that's right all of the time is the luxury afforded by an easy problem. Um, and so in the second half of the book, uh, in particular, we explore uh, basically what do computers do when they're up against a problem that they can't take that approach. Um, so this class of problems is generally known in computer science as intractable. Um, and that doesn't mean that you just give up. Um, there's a whole series of strategies for making progress even in an intractable problem. Um, and those are the sorts of things that look a lot more like what we do. You know, Brian, I, I can't resist because of your background in poetry. Um, so many ways poetry is Im intended and meant to appear as if it was just done and it, was, it wasn't it was rehearsed, it wasn't practiced. It w it, no one took a lot of time changing the word, moving the comma, doing something. But yet there's, a, there's an embedded structure in that and it's very deep. How is this in relationship to what you're talking about? In other words, Human behavior, no matter how we look at it, does have an underlying structure. And much of what you're doing in the algorithms is not only discovering, hopefully, that structure, but beginning to uh, pro uh, project that that structure mm -hmm. will lead to a better outcome. And, and actually focusing a bit on the structure in the algorithm rather than uh, just in the behavior as if there were no structure. Mm -hmm. Is that clear, that what I'm asking? Um, and are you asking about this in the context of poetry? Yeah, in the context of poetry, and then if you don't mind, Tom, I would like you to think about that in, in the context of cognitive science. Um, I, one, one of my uh, advisors when I was in graduate school for poetry said that, you know, the, the danger any poet faces is that the poem reduces to nothing but structure. Um, and I do think that certainly of, of all the literary arts, poets are the most structurally obsessed. Um, and for me, it, it's this fascinating question, especially in contemporary poetics, where the, the question of how formal one ought to be is mm -hmm. very much this active question. There are these warring camps. Um, it's always exciting when there are warring camps. Um, and um, one of my favorite poets is a, a writer by the name of Ben Lerner, and he talks about, he made a his first book was all sonnets, but he's this like aggressively avant-garde poet. And so it's very strange for someone like that to, to publish their first book 
that's all sonnets. What you come to realize is that they, they really start to not resemble what we think a sonnet should be. Right. Um, and so he plays with what he calls the, the formal generative violence of form. Um, and that because it's kind of the, the nature of poetry that there's a, a tension between the, uh, the nature of the thought that's trying to be expressed and the you know, rigidity of the structure that <laughs> is being imposed on it. Exactly. And he's playing with exactly that. So I mean, this is very much a live question uh, in literature, and I yeah I think it's I think it's appropriate to to take a computational lens on on even some of that. Yeah, I mean I think in cognitive science the way that I think about this is in terms of uh, you know one of the challenges that you have in being a cognitive scientist is explaining to people that the things that they're doing are actually difficult, right? So uh, for all of us, you know, listening to this conversation is pretty straightforward, and you're sort of making sense of it in your heads, and you know you're not having a problem if somebody asked you in a few minutes what was going on. You could explain it to them. You know, there's a, a way in which language works for us fluidly, and you're not even w worrying about what's going on in your visual system as you're making sense of the you know light that's hitting your retina and resolving that into images of people and so on. And all of the multitude of incredibly difficult computational problems that you're solving just sitting there, right? When it doesn't feel like your brain is working that hard, um, and so. Uh, uh, the the reason why we have that tension though is that you know the things that seem easiest to people are often the things that it's hardest to express in formal terms. That you know there are lots of problems that you can get a four year old to solve. I know I I, I have a, you know small children and you know they can solve all sorts of problems that we're not able to solve using computers yet. Um, uh, and uh, which you know they can also do. I'm, I'm quite glad that we don't have computers doing all the things that my small children are doing. Uh, but um, uh, as a, th that that's reflects the fact that I think a lot of the things that we sort of take for granted and and are a fluid part of our consciousness and yes. you know that we don't think about as actually being difficult uh, are the things that when you start to try and formalize them actually become really challenging to express. Yeah. Tom, you brought up before. Uh, game theory, and um, how does that relate to what we're talking about? Well, so game theory is the uh, the, the the last chapter uh, of the book, really. You know, before we sort of conclude, um, and the reason why it's there is that for most of the book, what we're focused on is really uh, it's questions about how individuals can go about solving problems. Right? It's you know in the uh, the canonical plots that we you know, we, we consider for different kinds of stories we can tell, right? Most of the book is, you know, man versus nature, and, and that's the point where we start to talk about what happens when you have to interact with other people too, right? So we have a, a different set of computational problems that arise in that context. Um, and so uh, the, 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 the counterintuitive insights that we, we focus on in that chapter are really what comes out of thinking about game theory not just as a kind of you know a mathematical theory that describes how people should interact, um, but as part of a computational theory where we start to think about not just well what 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 is what are the sort of prescriptive game theoretic solutions in these cases, but also how hard does the computer have to work or how hard does your mind have to work in engaging in you know those kinds of interactions or following those kinds of strategies. So. I mean, one way of explaining uh, a, a sense in which you know hell is other people. In fact, very much the way that Sartre uh, wanted to express it is just the fact that thinking about other people and thinking about what other people are thinking about you and thinking about what the other people are thinking about what you're thinking about them and thinking about you and so on and so on establishes an incredibly difficult computational problem from the get-go. Right? Um, uh, you know, for our computers, one of the hardest things that a computer can do is simulate another computer, right? Um, and that's essentially what you have to do every time you have to interact with somebody and think about, okay, what are they thinking, what are they thinking, and so on. Um, and game theory seems like it kind of cuts through all that because it says, here's the way that, you know, in this situation, act like this, in this situation, act like this, in this situation, mm -hmm. act like this. And it seems like it's going to solve that problem. But in fact, it turns out that finding those solutions themselves is incredibly computationally difficult. And so, uh, we're, we're sort of left with a question which is more about how, how can you avoid running into these computational difficulties in the first place? Mm -hmm. How should you structure interactions to make it so that people can interact with one another 
easily without needing to worry about second guessing themselves and so on. And so um, that's a topic that we talk about in depth and we talk about the role that emotions can play in that in terms of uh, essentially redesigning the structure of an interaction in a way that removes a lot of that computational load. Um, and we also talk about a concept that we call computational kindness, which mm -hmm. is the idea of uh, if you are somebody who's going to be engaging in an interaction with another person, you're essentially posing a computational problem to that other person. And so by structuring that interaction in different ways, you can change the amount of computational effort that you're making that person do. I, Go ahead, please. Just to, to piggyback on that, I mean, I think this idea that um, the ways that we interact with other people or force other people to interact with us can be structured as these games. The, the playing of these games has computational costs. Um, there can be ways to minimize those costs. I think one of my favorite examples in the book, we talk about au auctions, right? So if you're, I mean, if you've tried to buy a house or something like this, um, there are a lot of domains in life that take the form of auctions. And uh, specifically, buying a house typically resembles what's called a first price auction, which is probably the simplest form that, uh, that there is, which is everyone writes down a bid, they submit it in secret, the person with the highest bid wins, and they pay the number that they wrote down and they get the house. Um, now, if you think about being in one of these auctions, um, you're immediately aware that you want to know what everyone else is going to bid, right? The ideal bid is just one dollar more than the second highest person. Um, anything you bid above that is like wasted money, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all predicated on knowing what the other people are going to do. And so, I mean, we in the end notes we give like what is the optimal bet if you're in a first price auction with n participants. It's, anyway, we can get into that. But uh, the beautiful thing here is that you can transform the rules of the auction with one slight tweak such that it eliminates all of the strategy required to play the game. So if instead you have what's called a second price auction, which is everyone writes down a bid in secret, the person who write down, writes down the highest bid wins the house, but they pay the amount of the second highest bid. Um, all of a sudden, the game is completely transformed from a case where you have to try to get into the head of your opponent to one where you just, you know what your maximum willingness to pay is for that thing, you just write it down. And the rules of the game optimize the price that you'll end up paying for you. So there's absolutely, you, there's absolutely no benefit to being strategic. Um, what, one of the terms in the literature for this is that the game is strategy proof. Um, there's just no point to, to thinking about it any harder than that. Um, and moreover, there's this really lovely theorem in, in computational game theory called the revelation principle, which states that any game that requires that kind of getting into your opponent's head, what do you think, I think you think, strategy, can be transformed by some alteration of the rules into a game that has the same outcome, the same person wins it for the same price, but no one had to lie, no one had to think about what each person was thinking about. Um, so that there, are, some of the computer scientists that we talk to feel like downright utopian about this result. It's a pretty recent result, and so uh, you know, there's this idea that we can just kind of make these subtle alterations to society, such that you know, we, anytime you you're forced to anticipate the thoughts of someone else, um, it's kind of a shame. It's just a bad game. Uh, you, there, there should be a way to, to change that game so you wouldn't have to do that. Tom, you mentioned before interactions, and you talked about ways, or you suggested that we could change some of that. Could you give some examples? So, I mean, what Brian was talking about was, was one example of that, right? right. So, so that's a case where there's a much computationally kinder way of structuring that interaction, which is, if you get to choose the auction rules, you can choose the auction rules in a way where nobody has to expend extra cognitive effort, right? Um, and I think that's a general kind of design principle. It's one that is much more attention has been paid to it in the context of algorithmic game theory, where you know computation. One, one way of thinking about kind of theoretical computer science is that um, you know thinking is bad, right? Like you want to minimize the amount of thinking that you have to do, and so that's kind of the goal of, of every computer scientist is to just minimize the amount of thought that the computer has to do. And that's not normally a metric that we apply mm -hmm. 
in the context of thinking about how to structure either human interactions or um, uh, even things like designing a parking garage, right? We talked about the optimal parking rule. That optimal parking rule only works when you're driving along a, a sequence of cars, right? And, it's, and uh, you get closer to your destination as you drive further along that sequence. So um, if you have a parking situation which is much more complicated than that, where you know you can go, you get to choose, do I go left, do I go right, you know, do this. So you know those garages where you just spiral around, mm -hmm. right? The, that's a much more computationally kind design for that kind of thing because you can then follow this really simple algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's the opportunity to do that in a lot of other kinds of interactions too. So you know we also talk about things like. Um, there's this canonical problem that I think everyone faces where you're just trying to decide where to go out for dinner with a group of people. And you go around the group and everyone's like, I'm easy, we could go anywhere. What guy could do this, I could do that. Uh, and that's a terrible process because in fact, everybody has some utility function, right? But now everybody has to work to infer what they think the utility function of the other person was. Uh, so actually there's an embarrassing story about this when, when um, I was first visiting my wife's family. Um, uh, this would happen every night. And we'd be like, where do we go for dinner? And everyone would go around and go, I could go anywhere, I could go anywhere. And it's like, okay, let's go get Thai food. And I was like, great, let's go get Thai food. And then they happen the next night. Go, let's get Mexican food. And they're like, great, let's get Mexican food. And then on the third night, you know, this is about to happen. And my, my wife was like, stop being a jerk. And I'm like, what? What happened? <laughs> but, you know, their convention was that, you know, there'd be a sort of emergent answer to this question of where to go out for dinner. And by expressing a preference, I was preempting this process, and as a consequence, uh, you know, uh, throwing the whole thing off track. So, uh, but I think there are there are there are nicer ways of being computationally kind, um, which can include things like saying, "Hey, let's go out to dinner." You know, here are four places that are great. I'd be happy to go to any of those, and at least you've constrained the set. And as you go around the group, maybe each person could knock off one of those, and then you end up with a place where you're willing to go. Um, and the, the, we talk about some of those kinds of strategies. Now, this is a little bit more of a personal question, so you don't have to answer it. After doing this theory, has it affected your behavior in any area? And are people like you more for it, or uh, are they avoiding you these days? <laughs> uh, so one of the counterintuitive things about computational kindness is that it often runs in the face of what we consider to be politeness. So I think uh, there's, there's an important kind of territory to be navigated in terms of <laughs> working those things out. But um, uh, I think in general, the ideas in the book were not things that we started using as a consequence of writing the book, but rather things that we had been using in the context of our own mm -hmm. lives and okay. were the outcome of you know, many years of just learning these mathematical ideas and so on, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and then you know, uh, sort of starting to crystallize those into something where we thought, wow, you know, I do this all the time. Maybe somebody else would be interested in knowing about this too. I don't know about you. Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the nicely sort of at first paradoxical experiences that Tom and I had, you know, researching the book was it involved doing a uh, huge number of interviews. And we discovered this strange thing, which was that people were much more likely to be available to speak with us, you know, at 1030 next Tuesday than at a time of your convenience next week. Um, and it turned out that, uh, constraining the problem such that it was perhaps not as inconvenient schedule-wise, but it just they didn't have to think as hard about it, um, that that was actually sort of a net positive for most people, and most people were happy to agree. So that was a case where we started to get this idea that, you know, the polite thing to do is defer to the, you know, priorities of the other person, but then you're also forcing the other person to compute what their priorities are and get back to you. So. Um, you know, again, there there is this kind of lovely tension between the things that we think of as polite, and um, and what might be computationally kind. You, you have you write about scheduling in the book, and what what would be your advice to people regarding scheduling? Just on that simple um, notion of beginning to pick a time, and what in your now in, in light of what you've been re, uh, writing, and in light of what you've been researching, how would you reframe the question to the individual? Um, I would say, I mean, so we have this uh, chapter on scheduling theory, That's right. kind of what's the relationship. So every, every operating system has this section of code that's known as the scheduler. Um, and it tells the CPU like, you know, check my email for 10 milliseconds and then, you know, uh, play my MP3 for, you know, three quarters of a millisecond, then do this, then do that. Um, and so there's this question of, you know, what, what can we learn about managing our time 
from thinking about how a CPU is kind of managing its, uh, its own workload at the millisecond scale. Um, and one of the things that emerged, I think for me, was, uh, you know, there's, the, there's that expression, a, a man with a watch knows what time it is. A man with two watches is never sure. Um, and so I think one of the, one of the, the problems in the field of scheduling uh, is it's not that there isn't uh, an optimal algorithm, it's that there are many optimal algorithms depending on what exactly it is that you care about. So if your highest, you know, if your highest priority is making sure that none of the things you're doing gets too far overdue, um, then there's this algorithm called earliest due date, EDD. Um, if your priority is just getting through as much of your to-do list as quickly as possible, there's a different optimal algorithm called shortest processing time, or SPT. Um, if you want to minimize the number of late tasks, but you don't necessarily care how late in any individual one of them is, there's this third algorithm called Moore's algorithm. Um, and so, you know, for me, the we, we discuss each of these things in their own right, because I think they're, each of them is interesting in their own right. But for me, the, the kind of meta question is that when we think about time management, we approach it from this perspective of like, okay, here are all these things, what do I do? And you know, to a scheduling theorist, you've left out the critical uh, premise, which is like, what are the things that you actually value? And so you can't, an you can't get an intelligible answer to this question of what order should you do them in until you've decided what it is you're trying to do. Are you trying to minimize maximum lateness? Are you trying to minimize the uh, sum of weighted completion times? You know, what, what is it that you value? And so um, this has been one of those things that I find popping up in my own life, which is there are times when I just want to do as many things as quickly as possible. And in that case, just sort of greedily checking off the easy items first is the optimal thing. Um, but you have to ask yourself whether you're in that scenario or not. And I think that's kind of this critical reflective step that's supposed to happen before you even ask the question of what you should be doing that uh, we don't often take that step. So that for me has been uh, one, of the, one of the big takeaways of that. In thinking about these algorithms, and so much of it is theoretical, and um, what I'm curious about has there been or have you done any research where people have applied, let's say, or tried an algorithm regarding mm -hmm. scheduling, parking, dating, apartment hunting, etc., and have actually, over a period of time, uh, done it and then have reported back that it works or that it's better or I made a better choice? Um, has there been any research along those lines, from the theory to the practice? I think that's a great question, yeah. I mean, it's... it's um uh, I think that would be a, a very productive line of research at this point, right? Um, there is research in uh, judgment and decision making, which is the, the sort of the literature which is about how people make decisions that looks at giving people simple heuristics, right? Simple rules of thumb that they can follow that, you know, those are instances of algorithms. Um, and they show that uh, when they do that, people end up, you know, making better decisions by the okay. metrics that they use. Um, and so some of the groups that they focus on there are things like you know doctors who are doing triage or something like that, where mm -hmm. they have this time critical situation, somebody comes in, they have to decide you know whether they uh, are having a heart attack or not. And so they have to make the decision quickly. They've got a few pieces of information they could use. And so they work out what's the optimal order to go through those pieces of information. What's the first thing you need to know? What's the second thing? What's the third thing? And sort of make a little, you know, decision tree out of that. So you can you can decide, okay, this person needs to be admitted immediately and they need to see a doctor as soon as possible. Um, so those kinds of applications are contexts where, you know, there's been a lot of evaluation of those kinds of methods and they, and they turn out to be effective. For a lot of the algorithms we talk about in the book, they really are not professional problems, but personal problems. Right? Yes, that's um, right. And, and that's what I found very exciting about the book, and it's algorithms to live by, so they right. are personal, <laughs> right. Um, and so in, in that sense, I think you know there's room to do exactly that kind of research. It's yes. not something that's been done, partly because people haven't sort of been motivated to think about you no. know, what's the optimal way of solving those problems in the same way that they might have in, say, a medical setting or something like that. I, I would say informally, one of the things that I really enjoyed 
about uh, doing all the interviews that we did was we got to ask these experts in various domains, um, do you, are you aware of applying your expert knowledge in this area when you face that problem in your everyday life? And it seemed like maybe half the people said, oh, of course. And the other half said, no, I never thought of that. Um, and you just see this light, huge light bulb going on in the back of their head. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the people we talked to was uh, Amnon Rappaport, who does a lot of work on optimal stopping problems. And we asked him, you know, do you think about this when you have to buy an apartment? And he says, yes. My, my personal instinct is to just get the first thing because I'm just an impatient person I want it over with. But knowing that you know, you're supposed to evaluate at least 37%, I try, to, I try to hang on slightly longer than I normally would. He seemed reasonably happy about that. <laughs> okay. Now, when should we just throw these algorithms out and forget about them? Um, I mean, ironically, that's, that's kind of one of the questions that we explicitly <laughs> consider. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we talk about, so we have a chapter on what's called overfitting, which is this idea that comes out of machine learning um, that basically asks this question of, um, you know, you're, you're training this model. Is there a, a sense in which you can overtrain it? Is there a sense in which you can sort of over, over practice something, um, over study something? And, you know, we, we give the, a, a number of examples from a, a number of different domains. I think one of the most, for me, one of the most arresting examples, the most kind of vivid examples, was um, in law enforcement and the military. Um, people think a lot about what's the relationship of the drills and the training that people do to the actual situations that they find themselves in. Um, and there have been a number of cases, for example, of uh, police officers that get involved in a gunfight and find themselves firing two shots, reholstering the weapon, picking the shells up, putting them in their pockets, and then drawing the gun again, mm -hmm. which is the firing range etiquette. Um, that you can overlearn these things to the point that, you know, your behavior in the situation that really counts is a function of the training itself. You know, you're, you're reproducing the training in a, in a way that's actually problematic. Um, and this has, you know, we argue this, this direct parallel in the world of machine learning where um, you can basically, uh, you're trying to develop this mathematical model, you give it some training data that you hope will generalize to the real world, um, but you can have this problem where it basically overlearns the training data and seems really amazing until you then try to use it on other examples uh, and it doesn't generalize. And so um, this, I think, the, the takeaway here is that there's basically a limit to how hard you should think about things, that it, that it really is possible to um, to be in a situation where gathering additional data, thinking harder, uh, considering more things, actually becomes uh, actually starts to deteriorate uh, the result that you get. So computer science itself gives us, I think, a powerful language for thinking about when to stop thinking or when to when to not approach something uh, rigorously. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a precise recommendation which comes out of this. So basically. The, the standard result is something like, you know, as your model gets more complex, there's more propensity for it to overfit the data that you have. So if someone comes and wants to sell you their stock market prediction engine and they say, mm -hmm. you know, it's got a thousand bells and whistles and knobs that we can turn and so on, and we turned all of those knobs and, you know, now we can perfectly predict the last 10 years of stock market data, you should be very worried, right? Because the more complex the model becomes, the more capacity it has to fit all of the wibbles and woggles in the data, and as a consequence, uh, it's going to be fitting not just the stuff in there that's the signal, but it's also going to be fitting the noise, right? Uh, in just the same way that, you know, you're overfitting the driving, uh, the shooting range e etiquette, right? Rather mm -hmm. than uh, doing what you're supposed to be doing, which is just learning how to shoot accurately, right? So you can characterize this, we talk about it as the gap between what you can measure and what matters, right? So what you can measure for the stock market is past performance, but what matters is future performance, right? Um, and because the data you have from the past is a proxy for the things that are going to happen in the future, there's a gap between what you can measure and what matters. And the larger that gap becomes, the greater the danger of overfitting. So the larger the gap between those things, the more dangerous it is to have a more complex model or to spend more time thinking or to spend time like, you know, if, you, if, if you're spending time really focused on, you know, the, the data that you have, uh, then you're potentially, you know, kind of paying too much attention to that, 
and as a consequence going to end up overfitting it. Um, and so uh, the, 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 the heuristic that comes out of that is then to say, well, you know, in a situation where that gap between what I can measure and what matters is big, then I should be particularly worried about complexity and I should not think too hard and I should just do something and it's going to be okay. Whereas when you've got really good data that's really informative about the thing that you care about, then thinking harder makes more sense and, and, it, and it's a reasonable thing to do. So I, mean, I think about this in the context of, you know, as an academic, I'm constantly doing things like writing grants and, you know, submitting papers and all of these kinds of things. Um, and the thing that matters is, you know, how that grant is evaluated by a panel of experts. The thing that I can measure is how I feel about the grant, right? Uh, and, you know, to the extent that that's a stochastic process where it's just something random is going to happen and those people at the other end are going to be flipping coins and, you know, I don't know what they're doing, but uh, the more random and unpredictable that evaluation process is going to be, the less time I should spend perfecting my grant proposal and, you know, actually tweaking every single little bit and making sure it's absolutely perfect. Because the thing that I'm tweaking is, you know, with respect to my evaluation of it, right? And that can potentially be a long way away from the thing that matters, which is mm -hmm. whatever process they're going to go through and evaluate. It. But please don't tell anyone that I don't put a lot of effort into yeah. it. <laughs> I work really hard on those grant proposals. It's just like, you know, it just stops me from obsessing at the end. Now, you have some sections on prediction, and um, we have a few minutes. Um, what would you say about prediction? Can this help you to predict? Yeah, uh, prediction is a great example of what mathematicians pejoratively call an ill-posed problem, uh, which is that it's a problem that does not have a unique solution. Um, so we give this example in the, in the book of uh, a, a particular uh, Princeton astrophysicist is on uh, a vacation in Europe, and he encounters the Berlin Wall and thinks to himself, huh, I wonder how long that, you know, th this wall has been standing for eight years I wonder how long this will continue to stand into the future. And so we talk about this from the perspective of, you know, not only is it ridiculous to try to make any kind of informed analysis of, of geopolitics that, you know, uh, more than, uh, you know, a very short time horizon away, but, but mathematically this is a completely laughable proposal because he's trying to make a prediction based on a single data point. I encountered it and it was eight years old. What do I, what do I, you know, it's, it's like the amount of possible hypotheses that you could generate from that is endless. Um, and what he does is he just takes this very kind of straightforward approach of, okay, let's say just hypothetically, I probably arrived at a random point in the duration of this object. So let's just assume I arrived exactly halfway into its life. Therefore, the rational thing to project is that the Berlin Wall will last for exactly eight more years. Um, and it's one of these, uh, and it's, he published this uh, in a paper, and it, there, it, it stirred up this huge amount of controversy, but um, we talk about it from the perspective of um, he's really making uh, you know, this, this inference that is in fact the optimal inference um, if you assume no knowledge of, of geopolitics or anything like that. So we, uh, this is known in, in the literature as the Copernican principle. Um, and so you can use the Copernican principle to make a bunch of other really fun predictions. So like, you know, if you've been dating someone for three months and you're trying to decide whether to like book those tickets in Tahoe or whatever, just ask yourself, is it three months away or not? And if it's more than three months away, just like <laughs> wait it out, baby. Um, there, we give the example, there was a, there was a New Yorker magazine cover last year that had a picture of a guy walking through New York City holding a smartphone with like, you know, your familiar like four by six grid of app icons. And it was subtitled New York City 2525. And uh, this, is, this is completely unjustified from the perspective of the Copernican principle. The Copernican principle would say the smartphone is 10 years old. It's probably only gonna be around for another 10 years. So uh, it's dicey to imagine that he'll have a smartphone in 2025 let alone five centuries later. And in fact, the Copernican principle tells you there won't even be a New York City in five <laughs> centuries from now. <laughs> Sorry, we did don't I just get a little heavy? <laughs> <laughs> um, let me, uh, as we're closing this, we're gonna open up to your questions. Now, 
I know you want people to buy the book, and of course you do, but <laughs> if you had to give your favorite algorithm that you would encourage this group to adopt, and I know this is a hard question, which one would it be? What, what area do you think your algorithms would have the greatest effect in changing the society to the good? <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like those are, in a way, those are kind of two separate questions in my okay. mind. In terms of like, which, what is my favorite one that I use in my own life or whatever? And what, yes. what do Go I think has the biggest that. impact mm -hmm. on society? Um, I would say, uh, I'll, I'll sort of cheat and say the same thing for both, which is um, the, one of the ideas that comes out of the explore exploit <laughs> dilemma is the idea of considering uh, where basically how much time you have left. The value of exploration is gonna be greater the more time you have left to enjoy the thing you've discovered. And mm -hmm. so I was just in a situation where, uh, so you know, you, the, the language of the book has leaked into not only my own life, but in that of everyone who knows me. And so like when my fiance and I decide where to eat, we say like, do you feel like exploiting tonight? Or do you want to <laughs> um, and we've been operating under the assumption that I was gonna be moving into her place in Oakland. And so the rational thing to do was to exclusively go to our favorite restaurants in San Francisco and try all sorts of new crazy stuff in Oakland because it probably wouldn't be very good. But if it was, we're gonna be there a while, so we'll get to enjoy it for a long time. And then the plot twist was that we actually changed our minds and decided that she would move to my apartment in San Francisco. And so then we immediately stopped uh, exploiting in San Francisco, and now we only go to new restaurants in San Francisco, and now we only go to our favorite restaurants in Oakland. So, so that's a, a case where just, I'm not sure that it's wildly different from what we might have done, but we have a language and we have kind of a formal structure with which to adjust uh, and, and feel that we're doing the right thing. I, you know what, I'm going to use an explore exploit example too. Um, uh, and it's, it's another angle on this, which is uh, one of the problems that we talk about in the book is the problem of regret minimization. So this is a criterion that computer scientists use for evaluating algorithms. Basically, in the context of the explore exploit problem, uh, you know, regret is the number of times you did something other than the very best option, right? And so regret minimizing algorithms are algorithms which you know, quickly find the best option and as a consequence minimize the number of times that you're, you're just doing things other than the thing that's gonna give you the best payoff down the line. But I think regret is a very psychologically natural notion too and it's something which looms large whenever we're making decisions. Uh, and one of the cool results is that um, there are regret minimizing algorithms for um, uh, the explore exploit problem. It turns out a lot of algorithms you can show satisfy this property. Um, uh, and while they don't guarantee that you'll have no regrets, they guarantee that the rate at which your regrets accumulate will be decreasing. So, you know, for people who like math, they, they, the, your, your regrets increase only logarithmically as a function of time. Um, so, so that's something which I find very reassuring uh, in terms of uh, knowing that, you know, even though things might not work out perfectly every time, the rate at which I'm doing the wrong thing is potentially decreasing. Like, it, you know, uh, it's nice to, like, I think we often evaluate our decisions in terms of the outcomes that they achieve. Like, you do something you're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, like, maybe some of Brian's restaurants, I don't know. But, um, uh, but really, you know, uh, this, one of the nice things about the algorithms we talk about is that if you're following the optimal process for making that decision, even if you got a bad algorithm, you were doing the right thing. And so if you know that you're following a regret minimizing algorithm, you know that it has this property that over time you're going to have you know, uh, uh, not fewer and fewer regrets, but regrets that are accumulating at a lower and lower rate. And so the, uh, one of these algorithms that has this property is, um, is called uh, the upper confidence bound algorithm. But basically the idea is that when you're trying to decide what you should do, you know, uh, what restaurant you should go to, who you should spend time with, you know, uh, you should be optimistic, right? You should be optimistic in the sense that you should think for each option not about how likely, what, how good you think it's going to be on average, like what your best guess of how good it's going to be is, but rather you should think about it in terms of how good it could plausibly be. So if you don't know anything about an option, it could plausibly be great and you should try it. Mm -hmm. If you know a little bit about it, and even if it's a, you know, sort of average in terms of the experiences you've had so far, the fact that you only know a little bit about it means that 
it could still be pretty good, you know, like in terms of, so the upper confidence bound is you think about the sort of confidence bound you have around the, the average value, right? The range of possible values it could be, and then you, you assume that it's the best of that, of that range. And so I feel like that just filled me with a, a sense of, you know, just a, a much more positive orientation towards the world where I could say, you know what? I should be optimistic about, you know, these, you know, someone new, great, you know, this could be great. And then, you know, maybe not. But so when you, you have the chance to uh, evaluate those options, it says do so in a way where you're open to it being the best thing it possibly could. And if, you, if you're maximally optimistic, you minimize regret. So I think that's a good moral. Great, thank you. Um, let's open it for questions. I've run out. So, um, okay, we've got just right